So I want to welcome you all here again to this second presentation tonight. I want to welcome those who are watching on DVD or online. A big warm welcome to you from the sunny shores of West Wall's End here in Newcastle. Uh, wonderful place, isn't that right? Wonderful place, West Wall's End. No other place I'd rather be tonight than at West Wall's End. So anyway, tonight um, in our series, Discover Hope, Finding Peace in Uncertain Times, our subject is Solving the Riddle of Religious Confusion. And once again tonight, we are going to what book of the Bible? We'll be going to the book of Revelation. Um, beautiful book of the Bible, the last book of the Bible. The book of Revelation, just a reminder, this is the structure of Revelation. I won't go through that with you again. We did that the other night briefly. I just want to point out that the very climax of the book of Revelation is not at the end, but the very climax of the book is where? In the middle of the book, it's the climax of the great controversy. The heart of Revelation is Revelation chapter 12 to 14. What's the heart of Revelation? Chapter 12 to 14. 12, 13, and 14. That's why we're spending so much time in Revelation 12, 13, and 14 because it's the very heart of the book of Revelation. In Revelation 12, we have the history of the church and Satan's attempt to destroy the church all the way through to the end of time. And then in Revelation 13, we have, we have God zeroing in with his microscope to help us understand how Satan tries to destroy God's end time church. That's Revelation chapter 13. And Revelation chapter 14 is God's response. God's what? God's response to Satan who tries to extinguish his church. God's response through his people, through the three angels' messages, through the second coming of Jesus Christ. These three messages, we've looked at them over and over again. The first angel's message, God's truth. The second angel's message, God points out Satan's lies. And in the third angel's message, God says what? It's your choice. Once these three messages have been proclaimed throughout the whole world, throughout the whole what? Throughout the whole world. It's the everlasting gospel. Then the next event in human history is what? What's that up there? The second coming of Jesus Christ. When this message that you and I are hearing tonight, that we've been hearing during the course of these two weeks, when this message is, is shared and presented to every single man, woman and child on planet earth, everyone's had an opportunity to make a choice either for God's truth or for Satan's what? lies, they've made their choice, then Jesus will come and the harvest will take place. That's what Revelation 14 says and that's how it climaxes. In Revelation, as we discovered in our previous presentation, God makes one final last appeal of love. And we read these words in Revelation 18.4 where the Bible says, Come out of her, what? My people, lest you share in her sins and lest you receive of her plagues. Come out of her, my people. And we discovered that the voice that cries out, come out of her, my people, that voice comes from where? From heaven itself. And we discovered that the one who has the authority, the greatest authority to refer to those who are seekers of truth as my people, he is who? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. And I believe that Jesus Christ is the one who cries out, come out of her, my people, lest you participate in her sins and lest you receive of her seven last plagues and be lost forevermore. So tonight, we want to discover the truth of what, of what God has to say regarding his people and where they are to go. God says, come out of Babylon. Does he leave us orphans and wandering aimlessly in the desert here, there and everywhere? No. That's never how God has worked. 
When God calls someone out of something, God always calls them into something else. Amen? That's what Scripture teaches all the way from Genesis to Revelation. So tonight we need to find out where is God calling my people, His people at the end of time. Fair enough? That's our question for tonight. But before we open up God's Word, what do we need to do? We need to pray. We need to pray and ask God for wisdom to guide and to lead us. So let's do that. Father in heaven, we have been on an incredible journey in the book of Revelation. Father, you have indeed uh, lived up to the title, the revelation, the unveiling, the apocalypse, the, the revealing of Jesus Christ and his truth as well as the revealing of the one who seeks to counterfeit Jesus Christ and his truth, the one who seeks to receive the worship who belongs, that belongs to Jesus Christ alone, and that is Satan himself. So we have been exposed to the beautiful truth of Jesus. We've been exposed to the lies of the devil, and tonight we have an opportunity to make a choice. Who will, who will we follow Jesus Christ and his truth or the enemy and his lies. So, Father, as we open the word once more tonight, we pray that you'll open our hearts and our minds, that we may be willing and able to discern the truth, that we may follow the truth that sets us free. For this is our prayer in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 The truth is, my friends, that according to some estimates that I have come across, there are roughly 4,200 religions around the world and over 30,000 different Christian groups. Is that a lot to choose from? That's a smorgasbord if you ever came across one. There are so many different religions, thousands of different Christian groups in their tens of thousands. So how, how do you find out where to go? How do you find out what church or what religion to be a part of? That's a good question. Do you go to the Yellow Pages? Who here uses the Yellow Pages still? You do. You don't, Pastor Michael. You do. Pastor Michael uses the Yellow Pages. When the Yellow Pages comes to my place, it goes immediately in the recycling bin. <laughs> because guess what I use? To find out information. Google. How many of you use Google? Yay! We're all the Googles. What happens when Google malfunctions? Then we're all gonna be then we're all gonna run to Pastor Michael's house. We're gonna run to Pastor Michael's house and ask him for the yellow pages <laughs> for a small fee. Do you know what the truth is? When people think of religion, when they think of Christianity, when they think of church, they scratch their heads and they think, How on earth am I supposed to find out where I ought to go? So guess what most people believe in today? Most Christians today believe in that it doesn't matter which church you go to as long as you go to a church somewhere. For all the churches teach, supposedly from the Bible, supposedly, they all believe in Jesus and the old saying, all rivers lead to what? The sea. Every single church, no matter what church you go to, will lead you to the same place, the kingdom of heaven. Is that true? Yes and no. Yes and no. We're going to discover how it is true, but it's not true at the same time. Now, the truth is that there's one Bible. How many Bibles are there? Well, there's one Bible. Essentially, there's one Bible. There's one truth. There's one Jesus Christ. There's one Holy Spirit. And yet there's more than 30,000 different Christian churches that are teaching varying different things. Can they all be right? No, they can't all be right. You can't have 15 different truths or 200 different truths. By definition, how many truths can you have? One. You can have one. So people today choose a church to belong to based on lots of different reasons. So I ask people, I ask people, why do people choose a particular church? Why do you go to a particular church? And these are some of the responses that I have come across. I go to this church because, now some of you may fit into one of these categories. It's close to my house. 
it's very close to my house, and so I come to this church because it's close to my house. Others say, well, it's the church I grew up in. My whole family goes there. That's why I go to this particular church. Then there are those that say, well, all my friends go there. I go to this church because all my friends go there. Is there anything wrong with going to a church where your friends are? Nothing wrong, unless we're going to get to the unless at the end. The people are friendly. That's why people come to West Walls End Church, because the people are friendly. Isn't that right, Pastor Michael? Yes. Absolutely. Well, then there are those that say they have a wonderful choir and music program. I would come to this church because of the wonderful music that these kids share. Will there be music tomorrow, kids? I hope so. I really, really hope so. In fact, I won't preach unless there's music. There you go. There you go. That's, that's bribery and corruption. That's blackmail if I ever saw it. <laughs> then there are those that go to a particular church because they have a great children's program. Is that the case here, Pastor Michael? Oh, absolutely. Tick that box. The minister is so nice. I know that this is the reason why people come to West Walls End Church. The main reason is because the minister is so nice. Is that true? <laughs> I can't go anywhere else. I just love the atmosphere. I feel such peace is what some people say. That's why I go to this particular church. Then there are those that say the luncheon is fantastic. And oh boy, I can put my hand up and say it's true of this church. The lunch here is amazing. Isn't that right, Bruce? Absolutely amazing. I've been saving myself all week for tomorrow lunch. I've been saving myself, just eating very moderately because I'm looking forward to lunch tomorrow. This place provides amazing food, amazing food. There are, there are some people that go to church only when it's the luncheon day and here it's every week. So we praise the Lord for that. It's good for business. You're thinking, what do you mean it's good for business? Well, there are some people who go to a particular church because their business flourishes more so there. If you're a mechanic, if you're a mechanic, you want to go to a, a large church where there are lots of cars. Isn't that right? That just only makes sense. And there are some people that do it for that reason. Then there is the person who goes to a particular church because the person they want to marry goes there. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. That's true. I know of some people who have gone to a particular church in order to marry that person. And, of, and I know of one person who once they married the person, they stopped going to church. And the person was like, what happened? Did someone say something? Did someone do something? Did someone offend you? You're not at church with me anymore. You don't want to go to church. And the person was like, well, I never wanted to go to church in the beginning. I only went to your church with you because I wanted to marry you. We're married now. Goodbye. Go to church. Have a good time. True story. How many of you know a situation like that? A mm, couple of you do as well. I know one. So, how should a follower of Jesus, how should a who? A follower of Jesus determine which church to attend and be part of. Do we go to Pastor Michael's Yellow Pages? Or do we go to Google in order to find out what church to attend to? Is that how we pick the church based on whether it has a wonderful choir, wonderful food, wonderful pastor, friends close to my home, and the list goes on and on? Is that how we choose the particular church? What do you think the answer is? No. No, that is not how we determine what church to go and to be part of. We don't go and pick a church that suits our particular lifestyle or suits our, our particular beliefs, the things that we like. Because today, the truth is today, you can find a church that fits with your lifestyle. Did you know that? You can find a church that fits with your lifestyle so that you will never, ever be comfortable, uncomfortable in church that you'll never be uncomfortable in church. You will never hear anything that will make you feel truly uncomfortable. You'll go home with lots of warm, fuzzy feelings every single week. And there are people that go to churches just like that, where they don't want to be made uncomfortable. Is there anything wrong with being made uncomfortable? Yes, there is. Is there everything right with being made uncomfortable at times? Yes, there is. You're thinking, I just confused you. 
The truth is, the Bible makes us feel uncomfortable at times. More often than not, if you are reading the Bible and you are still very comfortable in your life, there's a problem. Not with the Bible, but with you. Isn't that true? Because the last time I checked, the Bible tells me that it's like a two-edged sword and it cuts right to the very heart. God, through His Word, is trying to refine me. God, through His Word, is trying to bring me closer to Himself, trying to weed out all the rubbish in my life, and He does that through His Word. Is that a comfortable process, yes or no? No, 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 no. We need the Word. So how do we determine what church to go to? We need to do what Solomon did. King Solomon, in 1 Kings chapter 3, there we have the story of two women, two women that come before Solomon, and they come holding two babies. The only problem is one of the babies is dead. There's only one baby that's alive. And they both claim that the baby that's alive belongs to them. They both claim that baby. So Solomon, how is he supposed to determine who the rightful mother is? There's no DNA test that he can do. This is 3,000 years ago. So how does Solomon work out who on earth is the rightful mother? The Bible says God gave Solomon wisdom. What, what did God give him? Wisdom, because Solomon asked for wisdom. He asked for wisdom that he may be able to judge the people of God in the right way. And so God gave him wisdom there and then. And he said, give me a sword. And he said, We'll sort this problem out once and for all. Give me the live baby. Soldier, cut the live baby in half. Give half of it to one mother. Give the other half to the other mother. One mother said, good idea, Solomon. Thumbs up from my end. The other mother said, no. No, no, no. Let the baby live. Give the baby to her. Solomon knew who the true mother was. How did Solomon know? Through the sword. What is the sword a symbol of in Scripture? The Bible. The Bible. The sword of the Spirit is the Word of God. The sword, the two-edged sword, helps us understand what truth is. The truth is, you go to the Bible to find out what truth is, then find a church teaching in harmony with the Bible. That is, that is how you determine which church to be a part of. You go to the Bible. You go where? You go to the Bible. You find out what the Bible teaches, and then you find a church that teaches in harmony with the Bible. You don't test the Bible by what the pastor says or what the preacher says, you test the preacher and the pastor by what the Bible says. Amen? I have a lot of people say to me, well, my pastor said this. And my question to them is what? What does your Bible say? I don't care what your pastor says. I care about what your Bible I care about what the Bible says. You and I need to realize the truth that there is no safety in believing any human being. The only safety we have at the end of time is to believe in the Bible and the Bible alone. That's why I've said it over and over again. It doesn't matter what I think, and with all due respect, that matters not what you think. The only thing that matters at the end of the day, the only thing that holds water at the end of the day is what God says in His Word. Amen? That's the only thing that holds water. That's the only thing that matters is what God says. Is it and it is written? Is it a thus saith the Lord? If it's not, it's not worth sharing. That's why. That is why I share with you only from the Bible. From where? From the Bible. And when you go home, you get one of these handouts that has the scriptures on there and many others besides that I haven't shared for you to go home and check it out for yourself. I don't want you to take my word for it. I want you to go home and check it out for yourself. Make a decision about everything in life, including what church to attend, based on the Bible and the Bible alone. Is that clear, yes or no? 
That's what the Bible teaches. Well, let's find out a little bit about the church of Jesus Christ. Who established this church? Notice what we read here in Matthew 16, verse 18, the words of Jesus. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my wall. My church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. So the church belongs to who ultimately? Jesus. He says it's my church. My church. He is the rock, the Petra. Peter. By the way, Peter, the Greek word for Peter is Petros. Is what? Petros, which means pebble. Petra, rock, is a big rock. And that's Jesus. Peter is just a little pebble. There is, the, there is the false belief that Christ built his church on Peter. Have mercy. Shortly after Jesus shared these words, Peter denied even knowing Jesus. I'm not putting my faith and trust in Peter. I'm not putting my faith and trust in any human being, but Jesus Christ alone. The Apostle Paul makes that abundantly clear. In Ephesians 4 verse 4, the Apostle Paul writes, there is how many bodies? One body, and he's speaking of the church there. The body of Christ is the church. And one spirit, one Holy Spirit, just as you are called in how many hopes? One hope of your calling. There's one second coming, one true second coming. There's one true Holy Spirit, and there's one true body of Christ. Yet, how many churches are there today in the world? Thousands of them. Thousands of them, tens of thousands of them. They are all claiming to be the bride of Christ. They're all claiming to be the true church. But you can't have everyone being the true church. We need to find out what the Bible says. And that's what we want to do tonight. Tonight we want to discover the truth that Revelation beautifully describes God's church. There's a woman. There are two women. We've looked at the first woman in our previous presentation, the scarlet harlot. This woman is the complete opposite. She is described in Revelation 12, we'll take a look at it in just a moment, as this pure woman dressed in the colors of light. This woman that, dis that, that, that is a symbol of Christ's church at the end of time. That this dragon, this seven-headed dragon with ten horns seeks to destroy. So let's read about this woman. Let's read about God's church in Revelation chapter 12. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman. What is a woman a symbol of in Bible prophecy? Church. Okay. Clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of 12 stars, representing the 12 tribes, representing the 12 disciples, representing the church of God. Notice this woman, she's clothed with the sun, Moon and stars. These three provide what? Beginning with L. Light. These three symbols are light-giving properties. You remember the woman in Revelation 17. Instead of giving the world light, instead of giving the world clarity, she gives the world what? Her wine, which makes them what? Drunk. Two completely opposite women, two completely opposite churches. That's what Revelation is speaking of. Let's keep going. Then being with child, she cried out in labor and in pain to give birth. And another sign appeared in heaven. Behold, a great fiery red dragon having how many heads? Seven heads and ten horns and seven diadems on his heads. This here is primarily, first and foremost, speaking of pagan Rome. Speaking of who? Pagan Rome. We're going to discover that as we keep reading. We've got pagan Rome, papal Rome during the 1260 years, and then at the end of time we've got, we've got resurrected papal Rome that leads the world, Revelation 17, seven heads and ten horns. Three times this beast appears in Revelation to give us the three different stages of this power that morphs from pagan Rome to papal Rome. Are we all together so far? I think I've lost about three people so far. His tail, speaking of the dragon, drew a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. What's that speaking of? That's speaking of a third of the angels. The stars, a symbol of the angels that followed the dragon, that followed Lucifer. 
And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to give birth to devour her child, capital C, as soon as it was born. What child do you think that is in reference to? Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. So the devil tried to destroy Jesus Christ at the very beginning. And we know that from the story there in the Gospels. King Herod. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up to God and to his throne. Then the woman fled into the wilderness where she has a place prepared by God that they should feed her there 1,260 days. So the dragon tries to destroy Jesus. He fails. He goes after the church that Jesus Christ established. And the Bible says the woman has to flee into the wilderness. The church of God has to flee into the wilderness. Why is that? Good question. We don't need to guess. Revelation 12 tells us. Now what we have that continues from verse 7 to verse 12, it's, it's as if we have an interlude. Uh, where God takes us back in time. We won't take the time to read those scriptures because we don't have time. God takes us back in time to the original war that took place in heaven between Michael, Jesus Christ, and the dragon, who is Satan. We have the casting out of the devil and Satan from heaven at the cross. And then we have him furious at guess who? We pick up the story in verse 12. Therefore rejoice, O heavens, and you who dwell in them. But woe to the inhabitants of the earth and the sea, for the devil has come down to you having great what? Wrath, because he knows that he has what? A short time. The last days began, according to Scripture, you can read about it in Hebrews chapter 1 and many other passages, the last days began with the death of Jesus Christ and the victory of Christ on Calvary. Since then, the devil has been angry with the inhabitants of this world. Everyone. He doesn't have any favorites. He hates everyone. He wants to destroy every single person. And now we continue to pick up the story that we left off there at the beginning of Revelation 12 in verse 6. Now, when the dragon saw that he had been cast to the earth, he persecuted the woman who gave birth to the male child. So now the focus moves from Jesus Christ to the woman. From Jesus Christ to who? The woman to the church of Jesus Christ. Revelation chapter 12, verses 1 to 6, the focus was on the dragon seeking to destroy Jesus Christ. Are we all together on that? Now the focus at the end of Revelation 12 is Satan seeking to destroy the church of Jesus Christ. Are we all together on that? That's what Revelation says. Let's keep going, and you'll see that very clearly. But the woman was given two wings of a great eagle that she might fly into the wilderness to her place, where she is nourished, this is by God, for a time and times and half a time. That's that 1260 days that we just read of earlier. Here it's described as a time, time and half a times, which is that 1260 year period from the presence of the serpent. We keep reading. So the serpent spewed water out of his mouth like a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away by the flood. In other words, to destroy the woman. Flood, water represents multitudes, nations. This is speaking of persecution taking place there in Western Europe, in the old world. But the earth helped the woman. Hang on a minute. Time out. Hold the bus. <gasps> We came across the earth on Wednesday night, didn't we? We came across a power, a political power that arises not out of the sea where all the powers before it had arisen, but arises where? Out of the earth. And that power that arises out of the earth in Revelation 13 verse 11 is what nation? The United States of America. The United States of America, here we have it. But the earth helped the woman, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon had spewed out of his mouth. So God said that he would open up a continent, a brand new continent, the new world, where those who were oppressed, where those who are being persecuted by the serpent who tries to destroy them would be able to go to find freedom, to worship according to the dictates of their conscience. Can you see that? 
It's incredible when you just follow, just follow the history. And then at the end of time, notice what takes place at the end of time. And the dragon was what? Enraged. You remember we read earlier, the dragon was wrath. It's that same word, enraged, wrath, angry with the woman, the church. And he went to make war with the rest or the remnant, the remaining ones. This is right at the end of time. Who The rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. These are the people the devil hates the most. Because you see, this group of people, those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ, they are God's end time remnant church. They are God's end time light bearers that are sharing the light of God's truth in a world that is filled with darkness, in a world that is drunk. A world that is what? Drunk with the wine of Babylon. And if only, if only the devil can get his hands on this small group of people at the end of time who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony, if only he could get his dirty little hands around them and snuff out their light, he will have the whole world in the palm of his hand. This group of people irritate the dragon, they irritate the devil, he's angry, he's wrath. It's like he's foaming at the mouth because they are that pebble in his shoe that just won't go away. If only he could wipe them out, he would have the whole world worshipping him. God's always had his light bearers, always. God's always had a remnant down through history. Let me give you just some examples. God has had light bearers, the first one being Adam. But then things went bad. Then God raised up Noah. Things went bad. God raised up Abraham and Israel. Things went bad. So God raised up who? Jesus Christ and the early church. Started off really well, but guess what? The devil got his dirty fingers into the early church and eventually... Paul told us the apostasy would take place. And that's what took place. And then who did God have to raise up? The reformers. God had to raise up the reformers. Men like Martin Luther and John Wycliffe and John Wesley and Jan Haas. The Waldenses, the Huguenots, the Hussites and many others. God raised them up to bring the world back to what? The truth of God's word. God has always had his people. They've always been in the minority, but God has always had his people. But sadly, what happened with the Reformation? We looked at that in our previous presentation. What's happening today with the protest? The protest is coming to an end. Isn't that right? The protest is coming to an end. There's no more protesting error, no more protesting the, the wine of Babylon. Do you realize that most Christian churches... 200 years ago, even 100 years ago, identified the great harlot of Revelation 17 as the Church of Rome. Do you realize that most Protestant churches identified the great harlot of Revelation 17, Babylon, as the Church of Rome? Will you hear that today in Protestant churches? Not on your life. Not on your... How is that going to help us all get together? And have a good time and be one. That's not going to be very helpful, is it? That's not going to be very helpful. Things are changing. So guess what God does? He raises up Revelation's remnant. The final end time group of people who are true and faithful to God's word and to Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And that's what we want to look at now. That's what we want to look at now. Revelation beautifully describes God's end time church. It's just so beautiful, so simple, so plain. As plain as the nose on your face, Phil. Not that you've got a big nose. As plain as the noonday sun. It's as plain as, and you will see that right now from your Bible. From where? From the Bible. From the book of Revelation. 
Firstly, let's take a look. Let's take a look at these seven identification marks. Let's put the pieces together and the pieces at the end will give a very clear picture. And that's what I love. That's what I love about the Bible. It's so clear. Can someone say amen? amen. The Bible's so clear. There's no guesswork. Guess who's into confusion? The king of Babylon. The king of Babel. And who's the king of Babylon? Who's the king of Babel? It's the devil himself. That's what we read in Isaiah chapter 14. He's into confusion. He's into giving you wine to make you drunk. What do you think people today, what do you think Christians today are like, I've got no idea about the book of Revelation. How am I supposed to understand the book of Revelation? How am I supposed to understand the book of Daniel? I've got no idea. It's impossible. Who do you think is behind all that? The devil. If we let the Bible interpret itself, it's clear as. Clear as. Easy, even for a five-year-old to understand. Okay, enough of that. First point, it is called the remnant. It stands on God's word alone. That's what it means to be the remnant. It means that you stand on God's word alone. There we have it. That word there, rest or the remaining ones or remnant in the King James Version appears over and over again to describe those who remain faithful and true to God. Read through the entire scriptures and you'll discover God has had a remnant, those who are faithful to him all the way through history. What did Jesus say in John 17, 17? Sanctify them by your what? Your truth. Your word is truth. God's word is truth. The Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Timothy 3, 15, But if I am delayed, I write so that you may know how you ought to conduct yourself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, the pillar and the ground of what? The truth. The Apostle Paul is very clear, crystal clear, that the church must have the Word of God as its pillar. As its what? How important is a pillar to keep a house up? Can you do away with the pillars and have your roof still standing? No. The pillar is essential. The pillar and the ground of truth must be the Word of God. So, that is point number one. For us to find God's true church, God's true church must believe in the Bible and the Bible alone. The Bible and what? The Bible alone, like Martin Luther, sola scriptura. Not the Bible and tradition, not the Bible and what I think and what you think and what's your opinion and what's my opinion. No, 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 no. The Bible and the Bible alone as the sole rule of authority in faith and practice. That's number one. Number two, it keeps all of God's Ten Commandments. If it's going to be God's church, it needs to keep all of God's sentiment. That's what it clearly says. The remnant, those who stand on God's word alone, they keep the commandments of God. How many of them? Ten. They're not ten suggestions. They're not ten good ideas. They're not some top ten on some late night TV show. They're not ten recommendations. They are ten commandments. How important? Well, it tells us God's end time people, Revelation 14, 12. Here they are. They're described again. Here are those who keep the commandments of God. They are referred to as patient saints and they have the faith of Jesus. And one last time, God's commandment keeping people are described in Revelation. The last chapter. Are you ready for this? The last chapter describes God's end time commandment keeping people. Notice what the Bible says. Revelation 22, verse 14, blessed are those, that word blessed is happy. It's the last time the word blessed appears, the seventh and final time in Revelation, the word blessed appears. Seven is what? Perfection. Seven is completion. Here God completes his happy, blessed picture by referring to those who do his commandments, not just talk about them, but do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. God's commandment keeping people will enter into the gates into the city. Are we saved by keeping the commandments? No. We're saved by what? We're saved by Jesus Christ and by having faith in him alone, by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But because we are saved, 
And because we love Jesus, we keep his commandments as he invited us to do in John 14, 15. By the way, in the very next verse, verse 15, the commandment breakers, they're outside the city. They're sadly lost. They have remained in Babylon and they are lost. Thirdly, Revelation identifies God's end time church as it will have the testimony of Jesus Christ. The testimony of Jesus Christ. There it is. Now, what is the testimony of Jesus Christ? Revelation tells us. We don't have to guess. We don't have to pass the hat around for a popular poll. No, Revelation tells us very clearly. Here it is. Revelation 19.10. And I fell at his feet to worship him. That's John is about to worship the angel. But he says to me, see that you do not do that. I am your fellow what? Servant and of your brethren who have the what? Testimony of Jesus Christ. So the testimony of Jesus. There's that phrase. Worship God for the testimony of Jesus is the what? Spirit of prophecy. God's end time church will have the prophetic gift in its midst. Should that be something strange to you and I? No. When I read my Bible from Genesis to Revelation, I discover that God has always sent His people prophets. He sent what? Prophets to lead and to guide them back to Him. To guide and lead them through difficult waters to prepare them for a major world event. Noah was a prophet, the Bible says. He prepared the world for the flood. Moses was a prophet. He prepared the children of Israel to leave Egypt and head into the land of Canaan. John the Baptist was a prophet. He prepared the people of his day for the first coming of Jesus. If God has always in the past used prophets to prepare God's people for a significant event, does it stand to reason that before the second coming of Jesus, which is the greatest event this universe will ever witness, that God will once again send a prophet to lead God's people back to the Bible? Does that stand to reason? Yes or no? It does in my mind because I'm following what Scripture has done in the past. So we expect that. So we shouldn't be surprised by that. Let's keep going. Number four. It has the patience of the saints, the Bible says. Revelation 14, 12, again describing God's end time people. Here is the patience of the saints. Now, I looked up that word patience. Okay, I wanted to get a deeper understanding. And you can do that yourself. Just go on. If you've got the internet, just go online. And this is from the online Blue Letter Bible. And it's a wonderful, a wonderful um, a dictionary, a wonderful concordance. It really unpacks the words. Pastor Michael is giving me the thumbs up. He obviously uses it as well. Notice this word, patience. It means steadfastness, constancy, endurance. Endurance. These are not flash in the pan followers of Jesus. These are followers of Jesus that go the distance. They do what? They go the distance. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. We're going to talk about that tomorrow morning. In the New Testament, the characteristic of a man or woman who is not swerved from his deliberate purpose and his loyalty to faith and piety by even the greatest trials and sufferings. Wow, that's what it means to be a patient saint. Nothing, how much? Nothing will swerve you away from being faithful to Jesus Christ. Nothing, even death itself, will not swerve you away from being loyal to Jesus Christ. Let's keep reading. Patiently, steadfastly, a patient, steadfast, waiting for, a patient, enduring, sustaining, perseverance. That's what the word patient means. These are God's end time people. They go through some serious trials. The Bible says some very heavy duty trials. Greater trials than any of God's people have ever faced down through history, but they will endure to the end through Jesus Christ. Amen? It has the faith of Jesus. It says, here are the commandments. They keep the commandments of God and they have the faith of Jesus. Those three words can also be translated faith in Jesus. They have the faith of Jesus, the same faith that Jesus had. And they also have faith in Jesus. Not in themselves, 
but in Jesus. I looked up that word faith. I wanted to get a handle on it, a better handle on it from Strong's Concordance. And this is what the word faith means. Moral conviction of religious truth, especially reliance upon who? Christ for salvation. They believe in what I've been saying over and over again, that we are saved by what? God's grace through Christ, through faith. They don't believe in salvation by works. They don't believe in salvation by your efforts. They believe in salvation through Christ alone, through his merits alone. Constant in your profession, assurance, belief, fidelity. I wanted to find out a little bit more about that word fidelity. You know what the word fidelity means? It means to be loyal. To be loyal no matter what the cost. Does this really describe God's end time people? Notice what I discovered in Revelation. Revelation 14.4, describing God's end time people. It says, these are the ones who were not defiled with women. They don't follow the harlot. They're not part of her children. For they are what? Virgins. To be a spiritual virgin means that you are true to God's word and to Jesus Christ alone. goes on. These are the ones who do what? They follow who? The lamb wherever he goes. Do you think they follow the lamb even if it means it's going to cost them their life? Do you think so? This is what the Bible says, Revelation 12, 11. And they, speaking of God's people, overcame him, that is the dragon, by the blood of the lamb. There it is, their faith in Christ. And by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the what? Death. We read in Revelation 13. We looked at that the other night. In Revelation 13, there is coming a time when if you want to be faithful and loyal to God and His Word and His commandments, you will not be able to buy or sell. Did you know that? Did you know that? We looked at that the other night. Only those who receive the mark of the beast in their forehead or in their hand will be able to buy and sell. If you don't receive the mark of the beast... Too bad, so sad, no pension, no coals, no woolies, no shell, no Caltex, no paying your bills, no nothing, zero. You will be completely banned from having anything to do with buying and selling, according to Scripture. That's what Revelation 13 says. Even, even death itself will be the final punishment for those who are not willing to succumb to this new worldwide religious and political order that will be established to receive the mark of the beast. That's serious stuff, isn't it? So if we are all getting uptight and we're getting our noses out of joint because someone said something in church and upset me, you know, I tell, I tell my church members, I say, you're kidding yourself that you're going to get through the end times. You're kidding yourself if you think you're going to get through if someone said something, someone looked at you and you stopped coming to church. I'm not going to stop coming to church because someone said something or someone did something or someone looked at me funny. Yes, we ought to be loving and kind and friendly and there's no excuse for being mean and nasty. I agree. But guess what? In the church, there's all sorts of people. Amen? Just like, just like in, in, in any organization, there's, just, there's all sorts of people. There's the beautiful, lovely, kind people and then there's the people that are just mean and nasty. But you and I need to be willing by the grace of God and through Christ alone and His strength to put up with whatever it takes in order to remain true to where God wants us to be. Amen? That's the bottom line. Point number six, it will be a worldwide movement. How do we know that? Well, Jesus said in Matthew 24, 14, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world as a witness to how many other nations? All the nations and then the end will come. This gospel, this gospel at the end of time is described as the everlasting gospel. Described as what? The everlasting gospel. It will be preached, the everlasting gospel, God's final message of love to the world, Revelation 14, 6 to 12. God's end time church, in order to be God's end time church, must preach the three angels' messages that prepares the world for the second coming of Jesus. That's what the Bible teaches. And what 
is that third, is what, what, how, how does the Revelation 14, 6 describe it? Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. This is God's final message of love. It's the gospel, but in an end time context. The three angels' messages. Now the truth is, my friends, there is only one church on earth today that fits every single one of these seven identification marks that God has given in His Word. There's only one church. Only one church out of 30,000 or more. Who knows how many there are? Only God knows. And that church is the Seventh-day Adventist church. Revelation identifies God's end-time remnant church as the Seventh-day Adventist church. Now let, me, now let me say, that does not mean it does not mean that only those who are Seventh-day Adventists are going to heaven. Amen? It does not mean that. God has His people everywhere, in all churches, in all religions, and in those who are part of no religion. God has His people in Babylon. He calls them my people. They're everywhere. But what this does tell me, what Revelation does tell me, is that God has a, a church, human faulty, with people in it that are not necessarily all the way they ought to be all the time. Yes, yes, yes. But he has a church that he can point to according to the book of Revelation and say, this is my end time church. This is my end time message. I'm inviting you to be part of this church. Those who are Seventh-day Adventist Christians, though should they walk around patting themselves on the back? Not on your life. Not on your life. If you're a Seventh-day Adventist Christian, you ought to be the most loving, the most humble, the most meek person on the planet. Why is that? That is because you have been given the greatest privilege at the end of time. And to those who receive great privileges is required great responsibility. Isn't that true? Seventh-day Adventists ought to be the most humble and loving and kind people. Well, don't take my word for it. Let's see if the Seventh-day Adventist church fulfills every, seven, every one of these seven requirements. Real quick, standing on God's word alone. Have we been preaching from the word of God night by night? Yes, sir. Absolutely. I haven't been going by anything else but the word of God. Keeping all of God's Ten Commandments. Have I been saying that it's important, according to God's Word, to keep all of His Ten Commandments? Tick. It will have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Now, this one we haven't talked about because we haven't had time. The spirit of prophecy, the gift of prophecy, was given by God to a young girl, 17 years old, by the name of Ellen Harmon, who became known after she married her husband, James White. She became known as Ellen White, 17-year-old, God gave her visions and dreams and she wrote thousands and thousands of pages to encourage God's people to do one ultimate thing. Well, two, but in one. To go back to the Bible, everything that she wrote is from the Bible and the Bible alone. And number two, she uplifted Jesus. Two things she does in her books. She upholds the Bible and she uplifts Jesus. Every single one of her books upholding Jesus and upholding his word. So it fulfills that, um, that, that important identification mark that God has given. And that is in harmony with God raising up prophets before any major event, as we looked at earlier. It has the faith of Jesus. We, we, we've spoken about that over and over again. The importance of, of, of having faith in Jesus, having the faith of Jesus. Is it a worldwide movement? Absolutely. Today, the Seventh-day Adventist Church is in more countries around the world than any other Protestant church on the planet. There is no other church on the planet that is in more countries than the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And for what reason? Because we truly believe as Seventh-day Adventists, God has given us a message to share with the whole world. And what is that message? It's a three angels message. Have we been talking about the three angels every night, almost, in the last week especially? Yes, we have. So the Seventh-day Adventist Church fulfills every single one of these seven identification marks. There's a lot more I could share with you regarding the origins of this church, which are clearly outlined in the book of Revelation, but we don't have time for that tonight. 
When God raised up Noah, he raised him to give a message. A message to prepare the world for what? For the flood. How many boats were there? There was one. There was one. At the end of time, God has prepared an ark. And he calls that ark the Seventh Adventist Church. He calls that the three angels' messages. This is not a church. It's a movement. A prophetic movement that God has raised up right on time. And tonight, Jesus says in John 10, 16, and there will be one flock and one shepherd. How many flock? One and one shepherd. Jesus says in John 10, 27, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Tonight, Jesus is inviting each and every one of us to be part of his flock, to be part of his church. This is the church of Jesus. It's the church of who? It's the church of Jesus Christ. This is not a human institution. God's church down through the centuries has never been a human institution. It's always been led by God himself. Jesus Christ said, I will build what? My church. This is the church of Jesus Christ at the end of time. At the end of time. So tonight, before we close, what do we need to do? We need to pray. So tonight, let us pray and let us thank God for his word and let us pray that he will keep us safe as we travel home. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you so much for the blessings of making it so clear from your word that you do indeed, at the end of time, have a church, not perfect by any stretch, but a church that you can point to, a prophetic movement that you have raised up in the last days of earth's history that is to prepare the world for the second coming of Jesus. We thank you, Father, for this church that Jesus Christ raised up. And we pray, Father, that you will help us to be ambassadors of your truth, sharing this wonderful message of your love that you're coming back soon and that you're inviting all to be part of your kingdom. May we share this message far and wide as part of your end time church, this church called the Seventh-day Adventist Church that you raised up and we thank you for it. Bless us now, we pray, as we enjoy some refreshments. Bless the food that's been prepared so lovingly and kindly for us. Give us strength from it. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen, amen and Amen and Amen.